All right, everyone. Welcome to our first week's material when we will start to work on the private sourcing of data. The private sourcing of data that we will work with primarily through this course will come through in the form of surveys. There are some other ways, of course, to get internal or private data related to something that we're trying to data mine or visualize. But for this instance, we will primarily just stick to surveys. Why on the planet would we want to use a survey? I'm sure all of us get surveys all the time, and it's really not the most fun thing to uh, have to answer them. So why would we do that? It, it tends to still be a really efficient way to collect the information we're looking for or for, uh, lo looking for um, from a large group of folks that may be all in one space, but could be spread out geographically, um, may not have time to uh, meet to collect data in real time. This gives us the ability to let them do it sort of in their own time. There's a flexible medium. We can capture measures. We can, or measures we can, goodness, it's a flexible medium. And we can measure attitudes of folks, how they feel or think about something, um, whether or not they have knowledge on a particular topic, what their preferences are related to any number of different items, and, and many, many more. It tends to be more standardized than, say, meeting someone for a focus group or meeting someone in person and making sure that you ask absolutely the same question over and over and over again without any change in intonation or out any additional commentary being asked in the question. Um, survey allows us to be very standard, very strict, very rigid on what we're asking. Surveys are just easy to administer, right? We can create them and share them out via text message, email, social media what have you. So they're, they're pretty fantastic in so, in so much that they're, they're pretty easy to handle and deploy. And of course, they can be tailored to anything you could possibly need to take a look at. So what are some of the keys to really being effective in our survey? First of all, don't just write the survey and think of questions on the fly. Begin your survey with a purpose know what it is that you are trying to collect or analyze or the information that you're looking for before you go about coming up with your questions or your methodologies. What are we trying to learn? What do we want to know? What are we looking for? That purpose will help the scope and the nature of your survey. So we make sure that we're asking the right things and not overburdening anybody. Know what you want to be able to do with your data. That's really important so that you have asked the right questions, but also so that you're capturing the, those responses in the right way. Are we looking for sentiment? Uh, this makes you happy, this makes you sad, I have a great feeling about this, I don't like it. Uh, are you trying to catch the number of times somebody does something or maybe how they rate something as I don't like this, I all the way up to I absolutely um, adore this. Those types of questions will help us with the type of data that we're, we're looking for. And so that we know our, our mining and our visualizations that we want to deploy later, uh, we have the correct data for those to work. Identify the most logical group to survey. Who should be taking this? Who do we want to collect the data from? Um, and make sure that we're able to target and segment just those particular people. The population of the people that you're trying to determine those survey results can usually be generalized if you have enough survey results. Uh, if you're looking for opinion on a certain actor or actress and you ask two or three people, well, it's not really going to give us very good data. But if you ask hundreds or thousands of people that, you can typically take those larger results and generalize it across the population. And that, in that way, surveys can be pretty powerful. It's a three-step process, and that's what we're going to walk through in the next several slides here. The construction, the admin, and the analysis of our results. So starting off with the first step here, survey construction. We want to have a title that is short, hopefully sweet. Uh, keep it concise. Make the title easy to understand. If you read it, you should exactly know what it's doing. And of course, make sure that it's relevant to uh, what is in the rest of the survey. In our introductory statement, 
provide uh, just a very quick summary of what your survey is doing. The information that you're trying to collect, um, any information about confidentiality should be also discussed here. So folks know maybe I should proceed or I shouldn't proceed. Hopefully this introductory statement has some information in it that really motivates the person to ultimately take your survey. They're probably inundated with many surveys, possibly even daily. Why should they choose yours? Make, it, make your opening statement compelling. Provide a time estimate. Um, when you're building your survey, you may want to take it several times or have somebody else take it and record how, off, how long it takes to complete that and then go back to your introduction and just modify that a little bit. You may say that there's five questions and it will take less than two minutes to complete, for instance. Of course, if you know that's true, you're going to want to make sure that's obviously accurate. And again, brevity, be very clear, very concise. Here's just a quick example. Thanks for agreeing to take part in this important survey measuring customer service satisfaction for a particular company. We'll be gaining your insights and opinions in order to serve you better in the future. It should take only four to five minutes to complete and be rest assured that all of your answers are provided in the strictest confidentiality. And then let them know how to get the survey started. Some effective questions. Um, here are some tips for some construction related to those questions. Include the directions for completing. Every question should have a defined objective. This one is really important, but pay close attention and don't use quote double barreled questions. Do you like pizza and ice cream? Just as an example here, um, we probably want to measure each of those individually, and they may need to be two questions. Lead with high interest questions first, close out with some demographic ones. So at the very least, potentially you got the data you were looking for if someone gets too tired of your survey. And again, keep it brief, keep it brief. Eliminate uh, any unnecessary questions if they just don't need it. Another thing to consider here is avoiding double negatives. Uh, just about everybody universally has um, difficulty understanding a double negative question. Um, you know, don't you not like going to this pizza shop, for instance? Um, don't you not love this? Like, be very careful with your double ended questions. You will get yourself in trouble um, because folks no, won't necessarily know what it is that you're looking for. Just a few notes on some question types. Open-ended questions can be very uh, alluring to folks because they, they require probably the least amount of work to set up. This provides that respondent just an open text box where they can express themselves in their own words. They can type essentially whatever they want. Um, with these, there really are no correct answers. It's you're going to get opinions. You're gonna get a lot of information they often elicit unanticipated responses, which provide new directions for research. Inside of these, because they're not so curated in what you can choose and not choose, you may get some interesting answers that could take you down a completely different rabbit hole. Uh, folks, if you don't have a space for comments, for instance, folks will often use open-ended questions and put in whatever random thoughts they may have um, for the survey maker. So be very careful with using these. They can be very difficult to interpret or analyze um, with these particular things. And there's a lot of thematic analysis that needs to happen. So it, it, it's going to require less work in the beginning to set up, but often much more work in the end when you're trying to analyze, uh, analyze what's going on. You can use short answer, a um, couple of words, or you can allow people to put in entire paragraphs and essays. And, and those are both perfectly fine. You may have, please enter your email address, that's a short answer. Describe the features of the iPhone that you want the most, that's gonna be an essay or a paragraph type answer. So some of the pros again, um, they, uh, they allow the, the respondents to define whatever they want. They can type whatever they want in those things. And they can obviously be a little bit more verbose, which may give you some more information. Some cons about these, um, they can be time consuming for the respondents. Someone's going to have to type out a whole lot of messages, uh, a whole lot of sentences about um, the message that they're trying to convey. And, and a lot of folks will often tire of, of doing that. 
Again, the results are more challenging to analyze because you have to do a lot of cleaning and a lot of thematic analysis to make sense of them. And you have to be careful about leading questions. Um, they can be less reliable. Some of the leading questions could be gearing someone towards a particular answer that they may not have thought of or a particular aspect of a product that they may have never considered or used, um, uh, or they may be guiding the respondent down a particular way you're trying to get them to answer. And it's sort of like putting your finger on the scale a bit, and um, it can get you into trouble with uh, how accurate your responses truly are. Another type of question here are the closed-ended questions, and these are the ones we're probably more likely to have experienced ourselves in a lot of surveys. Um, they have defined outcomes at the end. Um, did you go to a movie theater in the past 30 days? Yes or no. Um, it's not open-ended where someone can type in whatever they wanted. Um, they can be a little with this, they can be a little bit more difficult to write. You have to think of several eventualities that someone can choose. The responses are pretty easy to standardize and they can be analyzed statistically because you have counts of different responses that are that are pretty static. But they can miss some pertinent information if the answer key or the options, I should say, um, don't match with what somebody is looking for. Always make sure that you have an out in there or other uh, for instance, are not listed are, are simple and easy ways to, to take care of that. A couple examples here. Do you like learning German? We have some radio buttons here. Um, rate the difficulty of learning the following languages. We have a few options here. Um, the middle one is a little bit difficult because what if someone never chose to learn any of those? They don't necessarily have an out uh, for that question. And at the bottom one, how many hours in a week do you study German? Um, this one, you just slide the slider across to indicate the number of hours. So uh, this one is obviously geared towards someone who may already be taking a German course. Um, so um, hopefully this one isn't supposed to be overly broad because it certainly isn't. Some pros to the closed-ended questions, easy to answer, easy to analyze the results, as I said. Um, the cons of this, because they don't have text boxes around them, there's no real why. If you're looking for deeper meaning into the way somebody answers a question, yes, no, maybe, you're not going to get it because there's not an option or a place to do it. So they can limit some of the richness of detail you could get. There's limited options available to the respondents, and, and that could be a con. It can also be a pro, so someone's not there all day trying to uh, figure out what the possible responses for anything are. And they can be difficult to gauge. If you're ranking things from one to five or one to 10, um, a two can be sort of, sort of subjective. Maybe to one person, a two isn't as bad as it, it might be to someone else. So um, it can be difficult to use those scales and know how confident somebody truly is with their, with their answer. Some close questions here. How do you get to work um, driving, bus, walking? Well, this isn't great. There could be other ways that someone could get to work. I could ride my bike. I could roller skate. So sort of be careful, and you may want to choose an other option inside of this one. Describe your relationship with your boss. Do you get along well? Yes, no? No, there could be a sometimes. Um, there's another option where I could be my own boss. I work for myself. So again, make sure that we're pro providing um, enough substance, enough different ways for someone to answer. We're not going to do that class activity that I just passed. We're not all together. So some survey logic. Um, inside of our survey, uh, respondents should only be asked to answer questions that apply to them. So if you're asking, have you gone to a movie theater in the past 30 days and someone says no, they shouldn't be prompted to the next question, what movie did you see? Or how many times did you go? Um, so you're going to have to be careful that there's some logic built into your survey to make sure that we are allowing people to proceed or giving people an alternate escape out of the survey if it doesn't apply to them. Asking respondents to reply to questions that don't apply to them can lead them to confusion and unreliable results. So again, if someone says, have you been to the movie theater in the last 30 days? They say no, and you put them in the next question of what movie did they see? You're going to get some junk data um, because they may just fill in something because they have to. 
if we had better logic, we would have skipped that question uh, and gone to something else more, uh, more relevant to that respondent or ended the survey for them. So some skip logic allows you to send respondents to a future point in a survey based on how they answer a question. If they didn't uh, go to a movie theater, we would use some skip logic to send them somewhere else where maybe if they didn't go to a theater, they're not of interest to us, but we still want to capture that no and some of their demographic data. So we'd push them a little late, a little further down the survey. There's also some display logic. We can display questions based on whether or not somebody's answer to a previous question. If you put in here that you have zero kids, we shouldn't be asking you a question of what are your kids' names. So be careful on um, some of your display logic as well. At the end of the survey, we should just have a quick thank you to the respondent for participating, any contact information if they have any questions, um, and explain them to them how their survey results may be shared with other folks. Uh, if you provided any incentive, please let them know how they could claim that incentive. So they did a survey and they get maybe a $25 Amazon gift card. You're going to want to let them know uh, how that will be happening. Up next, we have the survey admin. So the first things we need to do is to identify our population. And this is the larger set of individuals you wish to understand. Say we want to understand moviegoers in general. That's our population. Anybody that see, has seen a movie. We're going to want to narrow that down by choosing a sample. And this is a subset selected from that population. So of all of the moviegoers, maybe we only want to get the moviegoers in Atlanta, for instance, or in Orlando or in Los Angeles, something like that. That could be a sample. And while that's still a pretty big sample, um, you could narrow it down even further, but we're just gonna go with that for, for this sake. Administrators at this high school randomly surveyed 100 other seniors to see how the seniors at the school felt about the lunch offering. So when we look at this statement, the population is all high school seniors in the entire world. The sample of that data would just be those at this particular high school. Or is the population all students in Riverside High and the sample is the seniors? Or is the population uh, all seniors at River, River, uh, Riverside High, Riverview High, and the sample is the 100 seniors surveyed? Which do you think it may be? Well, it's not going to be the first one. We're not talking about all, um, in this instance, all seniors in the entire world because they wouldn't have had the free lunch offering from the cafeteria. The next one, the population of all students and the sample is the seniors, probably not going to work either. The actual population that we're looking for is the population of seniors there, and our sample is 100 of those students. So. Um, C is the most likely option for, for this particular scenario. Some of the sampling text, techniques that are commonly used is a, just a random sample. Having members of the subset are chosen randomly um, so that no member of the population has an equal probability of being selected. Um, you could give all the seniors in that high school a number associated with them and use a random number associator. Uh, and uh, a random number generator and just start picking people who, who match that. Um, you could put everybody in alphabetical order and choose every third person or every eighth person. That would allow you to be pretty random as well. There's a stratified sample. The population is divided up into some relatively homogeneous groups and then a portion is uh, drawn from that sample. So you could take those seniors and you could stratify them against maybe a homeroom that they had. Um, you could say, stratify them across particular activities that they may do. You could of course, stratify across races and ethnicities or genders as well. And a convenient sample is members of the subset are selected according to their availability. You could just ask a hundred people, can you take this survey? Um, and start walking down the halls asking people to answer it. And once you hit 100, you've got your sample of convenience. You could go into the lunchroom at the lunchtime 
and identify 100 students that happened to be in the room at that time. And that would also be a sample out of convenience, which is also, you know, rent is pretty, pretty common as well. So then you want to select a medium. Uh, is this paper or mail? Um, you're going to spend a lot of money trying to get that done, and then you have to tabulate all the results probably manually. Telephone, this is not going to be so great. Uh, you're just randomly calling people and, and then trying to record their responses. Um, not, not too easy to administer so much anymore. Uh, electronic, easier to administer and to count. Um, we're just doing it in an online form, per, perhaps. Um, but, you know, a lot of folks get a lot of surveys all the time. And how likely are they going to, to answer yours? Um, they can shout out alert fatigue or uh, survey fatigue. And I have too many surveys and I'm just not doing it. And the last one is in person where you can go nag people <laughs> as you walk around somewhere and ask them to take your survey. Um, people are generally not so interested in doing this. Um, unless you're offering some kind of incentive to them, but it's another way to do it for sure. Step three, it's time to analyze our data. So we have some descriptive, we have a min, we have a max, there's an average, there's the one that most commonly occurs, that's our mode, and we have totals. This is one instance of how we could uh, measure and order results. We could theme them uh, using patterns. Uh, here we're asking about customer service. Did they first say that the experience was negative or positive? And then we can start to break down the questions further from that into sort of an org chart type fashion. Interpreting the results can be difficult when you have open-ended questions in particular. You know, what is the meaning? What are they really trying to say? What is um, the underlying thought that the, the respondent is trying to share. What are the relationships and trends that may be emerging? The more data you analyze, are you starting to see that customer service really is rated very poorly for uh, a few very specific types of reasons? Is it conclusive? Did we get enough data? Did we get enough patterns? Do we have enough responses that, yeah, this makes sense. We can see that um, we can apply a generalization here that folks uh, thematically are saying the same thing through our survey data. How do the findings relate to information or what we already know? Well, maybe we thought customer service was having a bit of a problem. And so we did this survey. And if it came to pass that everyone responded that customer service is amazing, something's going on, potentially. Um, or if the survey response, responses line up pretty closely with what we think is happening, that, yeah, there might be a customer service problem, that sort of helps us with that concrete evidence or sort of concrete evidence that, that we may need. It also may take us down the path of, did this get us all the data that we want? Or we need to start looking at additional surveys, uh, deeper surveys, deeper dive surveys, or a survey into an entirely different uh, area. That certainly can happen as well. When we go to finally report this data, our report should have a purpose. It should have some kind of statement about why we did this, what the goal of this was. The report should have the design of the survey and potentially even a, a blank copy of it. The administrative process, how do we identify our population? How do we choose our sample? How did we actually go get our, our uh, data? Did we talk to people? Did we send an email? Did we um, t uh, use the telephone? Something like that. Then our data analysis, um, how we pulled all of our data together, uh, how we grouped it, how we uh, counted, average, min, max, whatever we did, how did we do that? What was our methodology? And then lastly, our findings. What did this survey actually reveal? What, what did we find out in the span of doing the survey? And with that, that is my overview of using surveys to collect private data. Um, there's other methods that you can, of course, use. Like I, I mentioned, you may have an internal database that has a lot of this information in it. Um, but this is a, a pretty common way that's used to collect data um, from um, 
individuals by sort of individually contacting them either individually via email or phone um, and not widespread out areas like social media, which we'll cover next week um, when we do the surveying public data. Up next, we're going to go into Google Forms and we're going to take a look at creating a very simple survey inside of Google Forms that we may share uh, to get information on some, some moviegoers and what it is that they look for uh, or they like about some certain, some particular movies they may have recently seen. So what I'd like you to do, and um, this will be part of your assignment, is to create a particular survey, is if you just search for Google Forms, um, and hopefully you have a, some type of Google account. If not, you may want to create one to do this or you will need to create one to do this. And I'm just at Google Forms here, and then I'm gonna to go to the forms. And I have a couple of options up here for some templates, but I'm just gonna to go to the blank one and create my own template here. In this sample, I am just going to walk us through some of the features of Google Forms, and I'm going to just quickly put in some comments um, and introduction for our particular form. As you look to create a form for your assignment um, using a Google form for a particular question, you're going to want to be more descriptive, taking into consideration the PowerPoint presentation we just watched together to make sure that you have all of the elements that you should have in a good form. So I'm gonna start off my form and I'm just gonna give it a, a title here and we're just gonna call this form movie ratings, for instance. And, and, and that's good enough for what we're trying to do right now. Inside of this, after we give it a title, you're going to wanna to get a, a, some kind of a description. And here you're going to say, you know, what we're looking for, how we are collecting it, the purpose of our survey, and maybe thank you in advance for your participation. Great. And it's gonna give us our first question here. And so I'm gonna go into this first question and I'm going to say, have you, watched a movie in 2020. Pretty simple, right? And it's even suggesting us to use a yes, no, or maybe. I'm gonna choose add all, and then I'm going to remove the maybe. Um, the reason I'm doing this is I, I didn't wanna type out yes, no, I just wanted to, I guess, be a little bit faster in how I do this. In the right side here, we have multiple choice, but we can have check boxes, drop downs, and some other items that we'll use in the future. So one of the items here, this multiple choice really only allows anyone to use or to choose one particular answer. You can't choose yes and no. It will only allow you to choose one. The check boxes will allow you to choose multiple answers and drop down will allow you to choose typically one item out of a list, but I also don't want to build a list. We have short answer where someone's going to potentially record their name or a paragraph right below that if we wanted to choose some longer um, format for responses. The linear scale allows us to rate your movie from one to five, one being the lowest and five being highest. We also have the ability to catch the date and time uh, as well. And those are the, the larger things we're kind of going to use as we move through this. On the right, we have a little plus to add a section uh, or add a question, and that's gonna be mostly important uh, for us as, as we build. We could import questions that we had somewhere else. We could add titles and descriptions, bring in images or a video, but we'll also want to use this add section. So right below that, I'm just gonna click that add section to add another section below. If the person has watched a movie, well, I want them to continue forward. And if not, I'm probably gonna end their survey because I don't need their information. Um, or I might choose to push them 
um, to record their demographics um, at the end of the survey. So we'll come back to this um, in just a little bit. So here in my first section, I'm going to call this movie title. And I could give it a little bit of a description, but this I'm not too worried about for the moment. And I'm going to add a question in here, but I want to know the title of the movie. And while I can't particularly know what anybody saw at any time, so I'm going to choose short answer. And I'll say, what was the name of the movie you watched? And hopefully just get a short answer there. I'm going to add another question here and say, did you watch the movie alone or with others? Now here, I just want two options and I'm going to say alone and say with others. And those are my two options here. Now, again, I'm, I'm thinking about my design and I want to know next, if you watched it with others, how many other people did you watch your movie with? Knowing that if someone watched it alone, I don't want to send them to that question. So what I'm gonna do here is add another survey and I'll say, I'm gonna call this the watch details. And here I'll add a question and I'm gonna choose a uh, multiple choice here as well with how many people, including yourself, well, let's rephrase that. How many people, including yourself, watched the movie? And it's directing me to kind of put this in a short answer and they can just put a number in here I could also kind of guide this and just say multiple choice and say one. And as soon as I put in one, it gives me a suggestion. I'm going to add all of them in here to get five. And then I'm just going to say six plus. And that should be good enough for what I'm trying to do here. Now I'm going to go back up to my, did you watch alone or with others? And I'm going to click into that question box. In the stacked uh, periods here, stacked ellipsis, if you click on that, we can we have an option here to go to section based on answer. So I'm gonna click on that. If you watched it alone, I am going to maybe send you to submit form. I'm not sure, we may change that. Or with others, I am now, if you watched, if you watched with others, I want to send you to the watch details section. Great. I'm gonna add in another section below my uh, count here. And in here, I'm going to put my ratings. And then I'm gonna answer some questions, ask some questions below this. Let's see. Indicate below the degree to which you liked the, I'll say, acting in the movie, period. And I want a linear scale. One, dislike the acting. And I'll say the highest is love the acting. I also can change my scale to different numbers, but you wanna be careful and limit that as much as possible um, because too, it, it becomes too subjective as to, well, was something a seven or an eight or a three or a four. So sort of be careful with that. Now I wanna ask another question like this, but about the movie. And let's just say I'm too lazy to type it all over again. I can go down here and duplicate my question and I'm going to change this, this piece, and I'm gonna say music. Disliked music and loved the music. Great. So 
say for instance, these are the only things I'm really looking for in my survey. I'm going to add another section and I'm gonna call this demographics. Inside of my demographics, I'm going to say, please provide your name. And Google is automatically changing that to short answer, and I'm fine with that. And I'm going to add another question. Please describe the gender to which you best identify. And it's going to, also, I can't type. So I have some options down here. With some demographics, you want to be careful to be inclusive, but not too inclusive so that you have way too many options. So just be a little bit careful. And there's lots of internet sources on some best ways uh, to particularly go around race and, and gender. So I'm gonna add some options in here and I'm gonna say female. And then as I type this, Google's giving me some suggestions. So I'm going to say prefer not to say, but I don't really like other. I don't like the way that sounds. And I'm just gonna put in not listed. Um, other sort of puts folks in the particular category that I may not I may not want and have connotations that I may not be interested in. So I'm going to list this as other. Below that, I'm just going to put in, I'd like a date and please, select today's date and I could put in time if I wanted as well. Um, in each of these questions, I can mark them as uh, required if I wanted to, but I don't necessarily want to, uh, at least for this instance. Now, while I have this whole um, sort of template done, I need to go back to some of those navigation questions. Did you watch a movie in 2022? I'm gonna turn on my selection-based answers here by clicking in the bottom right. If you say yes, I'm going to move you next to section one uh, or the next section. It will do the same thing um, and it doesn't necessarily matter. So I can say go to the next section or go to the movie title. So that's fine. If you say no, I'm gonna send you to the demographics because I still want to record those. Name of the movie after you watched it. If you watched it with alone or by someone else with someone else. So if I say alone, I want to send those down to the ratings. So I'm going to go to ratings. If you watched it with others, I'm sending you to watch details, which is right here. After you complete this, they'll go to five, they'll choose their ratings, enter their demographics and done. So my form is, is done. I'm gonna go in the upper left corner quickly just change the name to movie ratings and life is pretty good. I would be able to send this survey out um, in emails or get a link to that I can share to folks. Uh, if I have the emails, I can put it here and send them a, a quick message and include the form in the mail, perhaps uh, in the email, perhaps, or I can of course um, just copy out this and post it to my social media, to my Twitters or uh, copy it and provide that in one other, maybe a text message form or something like that. As part of your homework assignment, I'm going to ask everyone to create a sample form with just a few questions, maybe just five or so questions. It really doesn't have to be uh, overly broad. I just want to make sure that we can demonstrate some understanding of how to use um, Google Forms. So when you're in the send form dialog, click on this link right here in the middle, which will bring up a link. Uh, when you go to submit your assignment in, in the upload text of uh, the assignment in your comments area, I want you to copy and paste this URL into that, into that comments. Alternatively, you can copy and paste this into a Word document, for instance, um, or um, when you're submitting your final screenshot, you can put that in this link in as a bit of text somewhere on the screen that I can find it. 
The important part is I'm going to need this link somehow, uh, either a comment, a separate upload, or as a text link uh, in your final upload. So that's a quick overview of how to use survey function, uh, use the survey function via Google Forms. And uh, a lot of companies will end up using this type because more than anything, it's free uh, as, to, as compared to some others. Now we'll say that afterwards you have received some responses. So you've sent your survey out, you had some great responses from some folks. And now we want to go see what that looks like. I have it saved on my desktop. Here, let's open that up. So let's say I sent my survey out. I have some, some great responses. And we'll take a look at what some of these look like. So my question, you know, I asked if they watched a movie in my example. I said, if it, did you watch a movie um, with Disney Plus over the past month, perhaps? Um, did you watch the movie alone or with other people? Depending on how you set your survey up in your responses, you could get ones and twos, or you could get yeses or no. So sort of be careful. Um, in my instance, I'm asking yes and no in my survey, but my data is recorded here from a different medium, and it came back in ones and twos. One is alone, and two is with other people. How many other people watched the movie with you? Um, to what degree did you like the acting? To which degree did you like the plot line? To which degree um, did you like, let's see, uh, the musical score? Uh, and how did you feel about this, the movie sets? I have some other questions here. What are your thoughts around um, the movie? You know, was it low? I, I really didn't like it. Disappointing, not that good, or all around to amazing movie. I asked their name, I have some information on gender, and then I asked the title of the movie that those individuals may have watched. Now that we have some data, it's our first opportunity to take this data and import it into Microsoft Power BI so that we can take our first looks at how to use this application. So at this point, I've got Microsoft Power BI open, and I usually come to this splash screen right here. In this instance, I'm just going to close it for the moment and make this full screen so it's a little bit easier for us to see. Once you look at this, it may start to feel really familiar. It may start to feel like any other Microsoft product. Uh, we have pretty common navigation here. Uh, we have some toolbars at the top where we can see different aspects of the application's functionality. And this may remind you very much of Excel. We have some visualizations, which we'll get to in just a moment. We have a filtering option. We have fields all the way over on the right. We have some data that we can import. We can import from Excel, from SQL Server. We can paste it in, um, or we can use a sample data set. And just like with Excel, we have tabs across the bottom where we can have multiple tabs representing multiple different items. On the left side, the tab that I'm on right now is the report tab, and this is where our visualizations typically are. Right below that, we have our data tab. This will, in just a little bit, look exactly like Excel. We're going to be working with tables. And then our last one is our relationships. Um, and this is how the different, um, perhaps tables, if you have more than one that we're importing, uh, would link and interact with each other. For our example, we're just going to be looking at one tab. So what I want to do is to um, so what I want to do is to go to our main landing page here, the report tab, top left, into the visualizations. And I'm going to port, import data from Excel. If you were at that main landing page, there is an option to get data in the upper left corner, or you can dismiss it, come to this page, and choose get data from here, or Excel workbook. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to choose Excel workbook. And I saved this one to my desktop. Movie and survey data. Great. I'm going to open it up.
the navigator is going to open up here and it's going to import my data here on the left side. I'm going to check the box to select it. And on the right will be a summary of all the data that was in the Excel file that I just showed. Everything looks good here. I'm pretty happy with all of that. And I'm going to choose down at the bottom here to load my data. It'll take just a moment while it brings the data in. And then because we're on the report page, we're not really going to see anything. We have no visuals to build, nothing to see. What we first need to do on the left side is to go to our data tab. And now this should really start to look and feel just like Excel. We have columns, we have dates, we have rows of data, and all of the data that we um, collected will appear here. So this all looks good. It imported my data. I see nothing wrong with this at first glance. So I'm going to go out to my report section here. And what I want to do is I want to start looking at our first sort of visualizations, the first things that we can do. So if it's open, you don't need to expand it. If it's not, you'll want to expand the visualizations. The first visualization I want us to take a look at is the matrix. And it's one, two, three, four, fifth row down and the third column over next to the R. So just click on that and it's going to put in uh, sort of a blank visualization here. I want to put some data in this um, in this this visualization. So now on the right, I'm going to go to fields. If it was collapsed, you can open it up and then you'll see our survey data with a little carrot. We're going to click on it so that it opens up down. What I want to do is I have a couple of questions that I'm going to need to answer. Here's an example where we have the same document that's available uh, for you to check out on uh, DTL, where I'm asking information about the movie that they watched. I have um, my survey information here, um, and then the things that I'm collecting. And then I have two questions at the end of this. Who watched the movie uh, alone more often, males or females? And what was the average rating of the acting in Cruella? So I'm going to go to my first one here. Who watched the movie more often alone, males or females? So what I think I'm going to do is in my rows column, I'm going to bring in gender. On the right side, you'll see gender. And then in, under the visualizations, you'll see rows. And it says add data fields here. Click and drag gender down to add data fields. On the left side, now you'll see male, female, and gender. Perfect. The next thing I want to ask is how often somebody watched one of those alone. And I may need to drag these out just so that I can um, read all of my column headers over on the right. You can also hover and um, it will give you what you need to see. So here's my first one. Did you watch the movie uh, alone or with others? I'm going to take this and I'm going to move it down to my columns box. I'm going to shrink all of this down a little bit so that my graph is a bit bigger. And I'm going to collapse my filters because I don't really need to see those. So what's really interesting is I have one and two, one meaning alone in my data, and two, but I don't have any data down here actually next to it. What I want to do is my column header is now, did you watch the movie alone or with others, but I don't have any values. So I'm going to take that same column and I'm going to bring it down here to my values section. It really did some strange things here. It put two females, one male, added them up. It brought in with others and put these numbers in here. When I go to my values, you'll see there's a down arrow. When you click on that, I notice that it's summing my data and I don't want that. I just want a count. So I'm gonna come down here to count. 
And now we can take a look at this visualization and say, who watched movies alone more often? It was the females. In instances where there were other people, it was the males who watched movies eight times with more than one person in it. This is a pretty small graphic and I really want to make it bigger. And you'll see that when I drag these handles around, nothing really happens. So what I want to do is make sure that you've clicked the visualization, it's selected and you should have these handles. I'd like you to then go over here to the visualizations uh, tab and in the middle you'll see a paint roller. Click on that. There's a lot of different options in here and what I really wanna do is increase the text size. The easiest way to do it is on your visualizations tab, go to the little paint roller here there's a lot of options in here. And the easiest way to do what I want to do, which is make the text size larger, is to just type in text size. I'm going to, I have the option for the whole grid, column headers, row headers, values. I just wanna be pretty easy. And I'm gonna to go to the grid section here and I'm gonna increase this a few times. You know, we'll say, we'll say 20 and that's great. Now I made everything a little bit bigger. This is much easier to read. My other question that I need to take a look at was what was the average? I want to display the average um, I just realized I have the wrong note up on there for the second question which is not the average rating. I wanted to see a list of the comments. So let's say display a list of the responded comments on Cruella. And we'll go ahead and fix all my spelling. So we're gonna display a list of all the respondent comments. The reason I want to do this one is we're just getting our feet wet and I don't want to get into too many of the, the possibilities of what it can uh, with some forming of numbers and changing that we'll have to do a little bit later on. So back in the visualizations, you saw that on the one, two, three, four, fifth column down, third in we chose matrix and one to the left of that is table. So I'm just gonna bring over tables. So I need to add some data fields into here. What I want to do is this what about the movie uh, or what were your thoughts? What are your thoughts on the movie? I'm going to bring that into my values. And you'll see I have lots of values here. Um, I can go to the paintbrush again and go to text size. And make the grid a little bit bigger and easier to read. But this is, this is for everything. This is not necessarily just Cruella. So what I need to be able to do is to make this where it's just showing me the the responses for Cruella. So in my visualizations, I'm going to go back to my data tab here in my fields tab, and I want to filter this data down. Well, we have a filter column here. So what are your thoughts about this? Filters on this page, filters on all pages. I want to just filter this particular visual, not all of them. So what I'm going to do is bring the title from the left side up and you'll see it's gonna give us a, a list of all of the titles there. I'm gonna choose Cruella. Fantastic. Now I'm showing just comments on the particular movie uh, that just pertain to Cruella. And it's about as easy as that. So this was a quick overview of how to start getting our feet wet inside of Power BI. And there's a lot more tools that we're going to go through um, with uh, this application as we move through the semester. I have a, a Word document that is posted on what I'd like you to do for our homework assignment, for our, our first homework assignment. We're going to do basically the same things that I did here, I recreated, but I'd like you to take that data that I've just used um, and do the same thing. So I'd like you to be able to recreate this. What I will ask for your upload is a screenshot 
of exactly what you see here and an attachment of your PBIX file if when you save this. So make sure you do a file and then you save this somewhere that you can get to it easily later on because the two things that I'm going to want are, like I said, just a screenshot of this piece here showing these two, um, these two visualizations. And you can paste that screenshot into a Word document and upload it or PowerPoint, what have you. Uh, but that's what I'd like you to do for the homework is to take the file that uh, is available in uh, DTL. It's called Movie and Survey Data. Import it into Power BI and then recreate the same visualizations that I just did around um, who watches the movie alone more often and the comments related to just Cruella. As always, if you have any questions, please send me an email and I look forward to working with you more. Thank you very much.